Hey, this is Kirk Barron. You're watching the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices anywhere in the country. And I have got the madman himself, one of the greatest speakers ever in the history of dentistry, Dr. Mike Detola. So you're not going to want to miss this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button, and we'll see you in just a second. Hey guys, welcome back. Welcome to the Best Practices Show, and we are having a blast, and today is no exception. I have got the madman himself, one of the greatest speakers of all time in the history of dentistry, Dr. Mike Detola. Mike, thanks for being on, brother. Kirk, my pleasure, and I think you probably just offended Frank Spear, John <laughs> Coyce, Gordon Christensen, and a whole lot of other people with that introduction. Hey, I had Howard last year, or last not last year, but last week, and he was offending everybody. So I, it's very our, good. <laughs> I think we can do it a good way, but you know, you you've got your own niche. While those guys are unbelievable, you're I would say this wholeheartedly. You're without question the most entertaining speaker probably ever in the history of dentistry. And I said this to you before the broadcast, you got to start speaking to people, not just dentists like you. You're awesome. Now, um, before we get started, because I want to say a couple things, because you and I are just going to roll and we're going to be able to talk a lot. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you have questions, please ask the questions. I'll be able to see the feed on the side and uh, we'll have a great time asking Mike all the questions that come up. So don't be afraid to ask those questions. And then the second thing is this is, um, you know, I'm going to start with a couple things that you don't even know about because I had Josh on on Friday and he's like, oh, you got to ask the dog about these things. Now, I didn't know this. You have won the SmackDown twice, not once, but twice. And I watched it this weekend. It was awesomely entertaining. And I actually had to stop it a few times because you were on a roll and it was so good and so fast. So if, you, if you're if you watching this right now, one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do is just Google SmackDown. And there's a dentist that's won that twice. Now, tell them what SmackDown is. Well, it's actually the Smack Off. And I, I only I only correct you because I think SmackDown might be a trademark term of WWF or WWE. And I don't want us to get to get sued. The this, this Smack Off is something that... Um, uh, Jim Rome is a nationally syndicated sports talk radio host. And um, I started listening to him, God, I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And I liked it because it wasn't just your normal kind of sports talk radio. This was a guy who um, he was funny and he used to take calls because he had to take calls. And he used to complain all the time about the how the calls sucked. They just yeah. weren't they weren't good. They weren't that entertaining. And every once in a while, he'd get a good call and um one day he decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to have a tournament for the best caller. So I know that for at least one day, all the calls that will come in uh, will be good. And so it was like an invite only um, tournament to come in on this one day. And he would give you as much time as you needed. If you were on a roll and things were going well, you could have six or seven minutes. And it was basically a combination of sports and just generalized smack, you know, just kind of talking crap about uh, sports teams or other callers or things like that. And uh, for me, as somebody who's always loved having a microphone um, in my hand, this was kind of a perfect, a perfect outlet to be able to get on the radio and, and kind of do a version of, um, you know, a little of what I do in, in my lectures, but but do it without having to include any clinical content or stuff like that and have it be about sports. And, and it was fun. And to this day, you know, I, I haven't participated in, I don't know, the last four or five years, just because you get busy with, you know, family and, and, and lectures and travel and work. Um, but to this day, people still come up um, and, and recognize me from it because I was one of the only people where he actually used their last name. Like most oh. people were just like uh, a Greg and Irvine or Kirk in Dallas. But he always referred to me as Doc Mike Detola because in the beginning, you know, before 
we had like text and stuff like that. We used to fax in. He had a fax contest every day. Right. So you would type up like three quick paragraphs and I like to write and he'd send it in. And for some reason he used my last name, which was kind of weird, but he used it and I didn't really care. But uh, to this day, like uh, FedEx drivers, UPS drivers, like the Dead Supply Serona salespeople, anybody who spends the majority of their time in their car every day, and if they're male, you know, and listen to sports radio, you know, most of them would listen to Jim. They either loved him or they hated him. He inspires that that kind of reaction in people. Uh, but for the ones that loved him, they heard it a lot. And I used to, you know, call in every Friday. And then those smack offs were difficult because that's when everybody brought, you know, brought their best stuff. But um, yeah, uh, won it, won it twice. And uh, but there's other other people, really talented people, who won it a couple more times. But it was always fun to kind of represent. Uh, the Dennis of the country who like like sports by by going on there and trying to run some sports related smack. Yeah, it was it's fabulous. So if you haven't seen it, you got to check it out. Now, you have been all over the place, and you just recently moved not too long ago, and you're now on the other side of the country, right? You're in Charlotte. So tell everybody where you're at, what you're doing, and who you are. If you well. Yeah, I, I grew up in Southern California and um, went to dental school in San Francisco, but then moved back to Southern California, graduated, spent like 14 years in private practice, and then moved inside of Glidewell uh, Dental Laboratory there in Newport Beach, where I was living, and uh, and then practiced inside of there for 15 years, and then recently moved out to Charlotte, North Carolina to become the Director of Clinical Affairs and the Director of uh, Dead Supply Sorona World, our big annual meeting um, for Dead Supply Serona. So yeah, after 52 years in Southern California, I moved out to uh, Charlotte, the uh, home of NASCAR and fried pickles, and uh, and had to make the adjustment to um, to Southern living, to humidity. I, yeah. I didn't really know what humidity was, and then moving out here at the at the in the middle of this summer. I discovered why like uh, t-shirts were invented because yeah. you sweat the second you get in your car and uh, just going out and running, you know, during that humidity was, was tough and learning what pimento cheese is and yeah. getting used to driving behind people who are, they're doing something that I'd never used to see in California and that is being courteous. And mm -hmm. so they're driving slower and it drives me kind of insane, but I'm starting to slowly get used to it. I'm starting to get used to the fact that when you're in line at a store, the person in front of you is going to probably spend six or seven minutes talking to the cashier about yeah. nothing having to do with <laughs> this transaction whatsoever. And it's just called being friendly. And I hadn't seen this before. So it was yeah. odd to me. And I'm still kind of still kind of getting used to that um, as well. And all the vegetables being deep fried. But uh, otherwise, it's been a smooth transition. And for me, Kirk, this is kind of a, a dream job getting to host I got to host Sarek 30 and then Sewer World last year and Dense Play Serona World this year. And it's allowed me to like, uh, you know, interview Sir Richard Branson on stage for an hour. And and we, you know, had Jerry Seinfeld there last year and the band One Republic. And we've got some big names that were uh, just about two weeks away from being able to announce for this upcoming year. But I can't give it away just yet. And so, yeah. you know, I, I being able to host it and, and come out and just, you know, tell jokes uh, in between all the speakers and keep the mood light and fun uh, is it, it really is a dream job uh, for me. So mo moving to Charlotte wasn't that big of a deal. I would have moved to like uh, Antarctica for, for yeah. this job. And so this is uh, this feels like uh, much easier than that. The people are nice. The town's nice. I'm getting used to it as a California guy, but um, I'm having a great time out here. Yeah, it's a great town. You'll fit in hopefully soon. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now I even heard this, I heard, uh, like you were having so much fun at one of the recent ones that you were hosting and I can't remember what year this was, but Steve Martin and Martin short, was that true? Were off stage watching you do your thing. And they're like, this guy's a dentist. Like they couldn't believe you were a dentist. Is that true? Uh, well specifically, yeah, Steve Martin, uh, made that comment to the, to the AV people. And I was very, very proud of that. It's one of my, my prouder moments. Um, yeah. And I and and then I got to introduce them and bring them on stage, and I got to tell a Steve Martin story that I had. He's responsible for me committing my first felony uh, <laughs> when I was when I was 17 years old. This is back when driver's licenses were like on photo paper uh -huh. in California. And my dad was a dentist, so I stole a, a scalpel from his office, and uh, I cut the zero out of my zip code and flip flopped it with part of the year of my birthday to so I would be t I could be 21. Um, it was so easy to alter 
driver's licenses back in the good old days. And uh, this allowed me to go to Las Vegas and get into his show, but I'd committed a felony by altering a federal document. And uh, I was telling my kids about this recently. I said, oh, you guys missed the good old days when it was so easy to alter your ID and be able to get mm-hmm. in places. And both my kids, one of who's 19 and one of who's 17, mm-hmm. both reached into their wallets and pulled out very authentic looking <laughs> fake, fake IDs. And they're like, no, dad, it's really easy to order these online now. And I was like, damn it. You're right. Yeah. Things have gotten easier since me having to sit there like a surgeon and cut out these two numbers and then and swap them. So I got to introduce Steve um, and Martin Short with that stories. And then uh, I actually outranked them in the rankings afterwards, which was That's uh, awesome. which which was nice. But to be fair, they were doing kind of an improv uh, show that they had put together. And I feel like I've had a lot more practice trying to make dentists laugh than they have. You know, you said earlier, I should go speak to normal people or you yeah. didn't say that, but you said regular or whatever you said, non-dental people. Uh, but honestly, they they would have a much easier time making non-dental people laugh. And part of, I like making dentists laugh. And uh, I, I appreciate the comment you made earlier, but the, the thought of going to uh, the Charlotte Comedy Zone and doing open mics, you know, for the next two or three years, I don't know. I, I think I'd rather be known as a, as a, a really funny dentist within dentistry than at the age of 53, like go out and try to build a, you know, stand up career against some other really funny uh, people. If it would have ever occurred to me when I was a kid, maybe to do it, I, I think it would have been a, it would have been okay then, but I'm not yeah. sure that I have the patience um, to do that now, but I appreciate, I, I appreciate the, co- and maybe not that, maybe it's going out and doing like uh, corporate keynote addresses for like 45 to 60 minutes that have right. a lot of humor uh, in it, I, I have thought about that. I'd love to do one on, you know, something about from the perspective of the world's most hated, you know, profession and kind of be able to, because allegedly, you know, everybody always says they hate, they hate coming to the dentist. And uh, I, I think that'd be a good setup for a talk about uh, it doesn't matter what other people think of you, you, you know, you stay committed to your goal and move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, you got, you've also got a ton of stories though, too. I mean, you've lived the life as a dentist. You've seen everything underneath the planet. And that's uh, one of the things that I want to talk to you about today. Like there's probably nobody better on this subject because you've seen everything. I mean, you were 15 years watching all this stuff coming back and forth from the lab, all that stuff. And, and the lab just becomes an integral part to a dentist being happy and being able to pre- create a predictable result. And um, just the ability to create that. What are some of the most common things? Like 15 years worth of experience. What's throw some <laughs> common errors that you see that get in the way of a dentist becoming who they want to be with the with the lab communication, crown and bridge communication. Well, yeah, and and in that 15 years, you know, Glidewell such an interesting uh, laboratory from the perspective of they work with dentists in all 50 countries. I'm in 50 countries, in all 50 states, and. Um, you know, so it's not just the two coasts or anything like that. California is the number one state, but New York's number two, Pennsylvania's number three, uh, Texas number four, Ohio's five, Florida six. So it's really well represented. And they do right around 120,000 crowns per month. Every month, 120,000 crowns coming in. And every month, right around 46,000 dentists order at least one thing from Glidewell. So it could be a bite guard or a snoring appliance or a crown, but they work with, that's almost half the dentists in America who order something from Glidewell on a monthly basis. So they they interact with a, a ton of dentists. And as you watch all this stuff come in from all 50 states, you know that you're seeing a pretty good cross section of what's going on in American general dentistry. And as you said, crown and bridge is typically the thing that makes GPs the happiest. You know, if you're if you're consulting or working with the dental office and and they're doing, you know, eight, six, eight units of crown and bridge per day, they're really happy. They're really right. productive. They're enjoying it. They probably have stopped like doing the stuff they don't like. Maybe it's dentures, maybe it's kids, maybe it's endo. Um, but if you're being that uh, productive, you can almost do whatever you want. Now, I don't know any dentist who refers out their crown and bridge. You know, I know plenty who don't do endo. Right. Or, or dentures or pedo or perio, uh, but nobody refers out the crown and bridge. It's really what dentists love to do. And if you look at the cases that come into Glidewell on a yearly basis, 74% of the cases that come in are for single unit crowns. So it's just wow. for one, one single unit. And then another 11% are for two unit crowns. 
And so you look at, you know, 74 and 11. So 85% of the work coming into the country's biggest laboratory are one and two units. And I think sometimes dentists get fixated on full arch dentistry or full mouth dentistry and these $60,000 cases that they hear other clinicians or a lecturer talk about. And you're like, wow, if I could just do, you know, one of those a month. But in my experience, those cases are Almost, almost more trouble than they're worth. Because if you have to remake four or five of those units as you go through it, it severely eats into the profitability of what you're doing. You lose a lot of stomach lining on those patients. You almost kind of become married to them. And so when you look at the Glidewell stats, you, you, know, you see that these one and two unit cases, especially the one unit cases, this seems to be the way that American Crown and Bridge gets done by GPs. Part of that's probably you know influence from the insurance company. Part of it is the way maybe dentistry is presented to the patient. Part of it's what the patient can afford, but I really think dentists need to get efficient at these one unit cases and the two unit cases and the three unit cases too. And this is, I think, the real bread and butter of a general dentistry practice. You can fund your retirement plan. You can send your kids to private school by doing these one and two unit cases. So the first thing I try to get dentists to do is is lighten up on the obsession with full arch and full mouth cases. That's really why prosthodontists exist. You know, there's a reason we want to have specialists to be able to refer these difficult cases to where they're going to be coming in time after time, getting the bite adjusted, things don't quite go right. That really doesn't happen that much on one and two unit cases. And if we can get proficient at those, um, we can have a great career in dentistry. So my first suggestion for dentists is to start measuring their remake rate. I don't know any dentist who, well, there's very few dentists who do it, but at Glidewell, we measured every dentist remake rate. So we could, any dentist could call in, we could pull it up and still can quickly on a computer and see exactly what their remake rate is. Uh, I was practically inside the laboratory, Kirk, and my remake rate, you know, it varied a little bit between like 6% and 8%. So for every 100 crowns that my dental technician brought me, you know, 94 of them would go into place that day and maybe six out of the hundred, um, she'd have to take them back and maybe add a contact or change the shade or something like that. And that's a pretty successful rate. When you're, when you're hitting things right 94 out of a hundred times, you almost don't even remember the six because they're kind of su such outliers that you can tell the patient, wow, this doesn't happen very often, but this, it just doesn't fit quite the way I want it to. I wouldn't put this in my wife's mouth or my mom's mouth. And I hate to make it come back, but we'll get it. it it'll be right next time. This rarely happens. And, and so 6% to 8% remake rate is great. Um, and I was working in the lab, so it was almost like I had an unfair advantage. So for a doctor who's not practicing inside a lab, I'd say eight to 10% would be a, a good, healthy number to shoot for. Now the, the scary thing is that, um, there was uh, a, not a large percentage of dentists, but, you know, out of those 44,000 that Glidewell works with on a monthly basis, you know, there's about 4,000 that uh, had a remake rate of 50% or over. And that's, okay. and that's kind of nuts. That's, wow. um, and that strikes most dentists as nuts that a remake rate would get that high where every time you had, you know, every, out of every hundred cases that would come in, 50 would fit and 50 wouldn't fit. Like it's the flip of a coin, whether or not that crown's going to fit. And that's a very frustrating way to practice um, dentistry. And uh, I, I couldn't believe some of those doctors continued to work with the lab. And you talk to some of them, they say, oh, I think you guys are amazing. And you say, but you have a, our, the remake rate's 50%. They said, yeah, but at my last lab, it was like 60%. You guys are the best. And you're like, oh, oh there, there's a definite disconnect between you and, and many labs here. But the dentist that even concerned me more where the, you know, 4,200 dentists that had a 0% remake rate, a 0% remake, no one's that good. Yeah. And the lab's not that good. There's just too many things that can go wrong. And you see these thousands of dentists with a 0% uh, percent remake rate, and they're doing, you know, upwards of uh, 150 crowns a year. And you're just like, that's not right. That's not normal. Um, it's, it's a, a dentist who's willing to kind of cement anything, you know, and put anything into place regardless of maybe how it looks, uh, or fits. And it, it's crazy to see that too. So start measuring your remake rate, just, just like the same way, Kirk, I'm sure you would suggest that they, they track, um, their treatment plan that they present and what the treatment plan acceptance is. Um, 
And it seems like if you don't track it and you just ask somebody, what's your treatment plan acceptance? Like, oh, I don't know, 90%. Oh, you, yeah. ask, you ask the front officer, like, yeah, mm, <laughs> not even close. 74, you know, yeah. if it's being tracked. And that's just the way I think human memory and and human nature is. So shoot for that, you know, anywhere from like eight, eight to 10 percent. But start measuring it first so you can really see what's going on and kind of hone down on those things. But the, the, the biggest problem we saw day in and day out was just a lack of of reduction and just not enough tooth structure being taken off to make room uh, for the crown. And it it, it happens on uh, almost 80% of the crowns in at least one area are yeah. unreduced and it drives the dental technicians crazy. Yeah. Take us through that. Like take us through the psychological piece. Cause you talk about the technical, but why is there not enough reduction? Cause I've heard this a lot, like go into the psyche of a dentist when that happens, like what's really going on? Well, every every dental lab, if you had every lab owner on in America mm -hmm. and asked them the same question, they would give you the exact same answer. So it's not like it's endemic to Glidewell. It's every lab in America not getting enough room. The psychology is, I think, well, there's a couple things going on. It's dentists attempting to be conservative mm -hmm. the wrong way. You know, so they're being so being conservative the right way means that you choose a material that requires the least amount of reduction, such as a cast gold crown, or right. if the patient won't tolerate that, and many won't, mm -hmm. like a solid zirconia crown. Being conservative the wrong way is still doing a PFM crown, which requires one and a half to two millimeters of reduction, still prescribing that, and then only reducing nine tenths of a millimeter. That's not conservative, that's just being wrong. That's right. not being conservative. Being conservative is knowing how much you have to reduce for different materials right. and then picking with the patient the most conservative material that you can. So conservatism or faux conservatism is, is part of it. And the other part is just it's an overestimation of our ability to see how much reduction we've done visually. It's an over. Um, reliance in our visual abilities. And it's so easy uh, to get away from by using depth cuts. So I, I use I use burrs that are these self-limiting depth cutters. So I can put a one millimeter hole in four different spots on the top of the tooth. Or I can take a 1.5 millimeter depth cutter and put four 1.5 millimeter depth cutters. And if and if somebody wants to see this technique, all you have to do is is Google reverse preparation technique. And this prep technique that I, I came up with to save my own job at Glidewell and to save my own dentistry and save my patients, it's available on a, on a bunch of different websites and it lists all the specific burrs and, and how, and how we do it. But, um, and it's not that difficult to do. It's just kind of a, a it's kind of come backwards from how most of us were taught to do it in dental school. And I, I literally had to come up with this technique because I needed a solution for my hands. I have a very average set of hands. In fact, they're probably below average if you, if I'm going to be very honest about it, but I was able to get above average results, um, by using this technique and, and the way dentists just kind of prep teeth. And then especially on a molar, we'll take a mirror and we'll pull the patient's cheek back and have them bite together and close one eye and stare into this dark abyss and go, yeah, that looks like a millimeter and a half. Are you kidding me? That's insane to think that you can see that. And and the way most dentists prep, if dentists were um, in the aviation industry flying airplanes, planes would be falling out of the sky left and right because we'd just be like doing it by the, the seat of our pants. And every I, I travel a lot like you to speak. And every time you get on an airplane, if you're lucky enough to be sitting up towards the front, if you lean over into the aisle and look into the cockpit, you'll see the pilots, both with gray hair, mm -hmm. sitting there with a checklist going down the chat, they've taken off and landed 30,000 times. They have this memorized Kirk, but mm -hmm. it's a rule that they follow this checklist and they don't want to die and they don't want to kill 170 other people. Right. So they go down this checklist to make sure they do it right. And that's what I do when I prep teeth is yeah. I, I have this checklist that I go down when I do it. I could probably do it without the checklist, um, but it's never as good when I try yeah. it without the checklist and my checklist is this burr kit and I just use the burrs from left to right and that video shows how to do it and it's simple, it's straightforward and it ensures that you've reduced enough 
for the dental technician. Because the funny thing is, dentists for once are lagging behind the dental lab industry when it comes to adopting digital technology. Mm -hmm. And so usually it's been the dentists, you know, grasping things like Empress or Emacs or whatever it is and pulling the laboratories into it, you know, kicking and screaming. But now, because it's such a time and labor saver for them, labs have gotten deep into digital technology. And so every time a dentist sends a case into a laboratory, they're scanning the model digitally and then measuring to a hundredth of a millimeter mm -hmm. how much you've reduced on that tooth. And so now if you look at it and close your one eye and think you've reduced 1.5 millimeters, they're going to look and see that you reduced 1.1 millimeter. And now when they call you up, you can't have this he said, she said argument about, no, I'm pretty sure that I gave you 1.5. They're going to send you a screenshot of the digital yeah. model showing you what you've reduced. And so this is the time for us to step up our game. This is the yeah. time for us to be more methodical, more scientific, to actually start measuring how much we're reducing as we're doing it so we know exactly how much we've reduced and we don't look like a bunch of buffoons yeah. when they're measuring it digitally and they can tell all of a sudden, our secret's out. They can tell yeah. that we're doing it by the seat of our pants and doing a hell of a lot of guessing when yeah. it comes to this. And I was the whipping boy when I was in the laboratory. I just had technicians yeah. coming all the time going, what the hell? Mm -hmm. You're under-reducing, all the dentists are under-reducing. Well, I thought you guys were doctors. What's wrong with you? And like, we're doctors who guess a lot. This is what we do. We close one eye because that's really what it is if you're not being more scientific or keep prepping the way you're prepping, but invest in a digital impression unit. And then you can scan it like the laboratory is going to scan it and see how much reduction you have. And if you need to reduce more before you send it to the laboratory. So you combine our tendency to under reduce with the dental technician's um, they always have this tendency to overbuild crowns in the name of aesthetics to make them more pretty. Yep. And so we don't take enough tooth off and they add too much back to the crown and you just end up with these huge crowns that never look good. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I get on a plane, the flight, flight attendant smiles and flight attendants have a lot of bad crowns on their anterior teeth. And every time I see it, my heart breaks just a little bit because I know there was a dentist who under-reduced there was a lab technician who overbuilt. And when those two get together, we we shove some ugly crowns in people's mouths and, and force them to tolerate those things. So under reduction is the big one. And again, if you want to reduce three tenths of a millimeter, that's fine. But you got to prescribe a cast gold crown. I have a six tenth of a millimeter reduction burr that I use for solid zirconia. That's the next most conservative material. It's fine to be conservative, but you've got to reduce the right amount for the material that you're using and it's not difficult to do these are all you know published you know reduction guidelines and with these burrs it makes it very simple that that one thing alone if dentists do that they will notice their they will start getting better looking crowns back um from their from their laboratories without having to pay any more money because now they're giving them enough room so that when they design the crown, which is all being done in software now in CAD CAM programs right. as long as you give the computer enough room it will give you beautiful anatomy and you don't have to have a super expensive you know laboratory technician or ceramist to do that it's all it's all built into the software these days yeah and you said see the pants like that's a big deal for you because you get to see this all the time dentists are flying by to see their pants and when you when it comes to di digital technology um What's bigger than the technology is the one thing a restorative dentist needs is just high levels of predictability. And the argument you could have is that the predictability now at the digital is that it's almost 100% and any error probably could be traced back to user error. So on both sides, you've got an incredible result. Now, I want to go back to the checklist thing because I love that. And uh, the Checklist Manifesto, I'm sure you've read it, right? One of the yep. best books ever written. And actually, I heard John Coyce mention that book the first time, and I was like, I got to read it. Read it. If you haven't read it, you got to read it because it's exactly what Mike mentioned is the whole thing checklist. And then I heard Coyce say this. This is pretty cool. Do you know there's over 5,000 airplanes in the air at one time across the United States during right. the middle of the day? Do you know that if we had a 1% error, 1%, that would mean how many plane crashes – per hour, you know, like right. you'd have almost one major plane crash per, I mean, hour per day right. likelihood. So the ideal of a checklist is just that you reduce everything you're talking about. You're not flying by the seat of your pants because your brain can't figure it out anyway. That is fantastic. Now on the other side, what else do you see people flying by the seat of their pants or big errors that you see in the <laughs> communication back and forth? Well, yeah, another, another one, um, is well, 
before before we get to that one path, there there is one other thing that, and you're right, the digital uh, impression systems, you know, the the six commercially available ones that we used at Glidewell, and that we we measured them all compared to a regular polyvinyl impression, and then pouring up a stone model the way we've made crowns for decades in dentistry. Um, all the digital impression devices are more accurate than taking a regular impression, a, as you would expect. Now it's only a percent and a half, two percent uh, more accurate, but it is more accurate. But that's not to say that the traditional ways of taking an impression with polyvinyl or polyether are broken. They're not. They they still work fine. Um, you can continue to use them if you if you choose to use them. Right now, only about eighteen percent of the impressions that come into Glidewell are digital, and the rest are still standard uh, silicone materials, and they work fine. But the digital technology does so much more than take the impression. In fact, if you just compare a digital impression unit to a polyvinyl impression, um, the digital impression is always gonna lose. Because if you look at Gordon Christensen's criteria, faster, easier, higher quality, more affordable, uh, they're not faster. They're not, digital impressions are not easier. They are higher quality. Mm but they're not initially as affordable. And so you can see why dentists stand a little bit on the sidelines when it comes to digital impressions, just from the standpoint of taking an impression. But there's so much more than that. They, they take your preparation once you scan it and you can blow it up 22 times on a computer monitor. You'll see things you can't even see with your loops on. You should get an hour of CE just for looking at each of these preps because you literally kind of go to school when you blow it up. You can see your margin in detail. This is the whole, mason dixon line for whether or not there's going to be recurrent decay on this crown down the road is how will the crown and the the tooth preparation come together and how tight that seal is um you can repair impressions you know typically you can't if you take an impression and there's a void on it you can't repair it in a digital impression if you have a little blood contamination you go with the diode laser clean up that tissue stop the bleeding just cut that area out on the digital impression scan that one area and it'll stitch it back in you can have your technician look at it using not Skype, but using like go to go to meeting or um, like WebEx, any kind of desktop sharing software. Um, if you have a digital impression unit, you can let your technician watch you take the impression. They can check your preps and impressions before you send it over, which is huge. One of my favorite things at, at Glidewell was having my technician Cindy come in and check all my cases. And I'd have her look at my preps and I say the anterior preps. And I'd say, am I done? And she'd look and say, um, can you round off the incisal edge of number six and 11? I go, yeah. And I'd round them off like that. She was perfect. Then she'd look again and go, can you taper the walls on seven and 10, the distal just a little more? Sure. Like that. Yep. All right. You're done. And every time she would look at my preps and say, you're done, I would get great looking restorations back because lab techs look at crown preps a lot differently than we do. They look at it with the, with the end crowns in mind. Sit, looking at it saying, do I have enough room to make these make beautiful looking crowns with what has been reduced? Whereas dentists, we look at the preps and we picture in our mind the unprepped teeth or we'll take the study model and look and say, did we remove enough? So it's we're both kind of looking at the same thing, but they're looking at it from a 180 degree different standpoint of they don't care how much we reduced. Mm-hmm. To them, it doesn't matter. To them, they're just looking at the preps and the adjacent teeth saying, do I have enough room to make some beautiful like Emacs crowns, for example? And so having a technician look at your preps, that's true teamwork. You know, Usually what passes for teamwork in dentistry is we prep the teeth, take an impression, put the temporaries on, dismiss the patient. The next day we send it to our lab and we say, do your best, deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that's not teamwork. That's like tying one hand behind their back and saying, you know, do your best as opposed to letting them see it while the patient's still there, still anesthetized. They're looking at it live as we show them. And the patient's impressed as hell when we say, oh, we're letting our technician make sure that, you know, we they've got all the things that they need. And if they want you to round off something because you've got some Bucky Beaver anterior preps that are going to lead to some huge crowns on eight and nine, the technician will have you reduce it and bring it back and your results always end up so much better. And they love being part of that team effort. They love yeah. that you respect their artistic nature enough and their abilities enough to bring them in at this point. And they'll try even harder on those cases when you make them part of that team. And that's yeah. that's a really big deal to get them involved. So you don't have to have a laboratory technician in your office. You can just share it with them digitally. But the most frustrating thing that I saw 
during my time at Glidewell was the fact that 95% of the cases that left the building, the occlusion on the articulated models was perfect. The bite was right on. You know, you could check with articulating paper and it was fine. Mm -hmm. And those cases would go out to all those different dentists who had ordered crown. Those 120,000 crowns would go out. And years ago, we would have, you know, 50, 55% complaints about the bite being high on the crowns. Mm -hmm. And when 95% of those crowns left the office, the bite was not high, but now it was. And th this drove us crazy. It was kind of like, how do we how do we work with this problem? And it became clear what the, the problem could only be one thing. It was the temporary crown that was in place. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for a well-meaning dental assistant, since most dentists uh, delegate that, um, that process of making the temporary crown. It's very easy for them in an attempt to make the crown nice and smooth and to not bother the patient's tongue or their cheek to over polish the, you know, the occlusal surface of that temporary crown. And then they put it in place. And if they over polish it, it's out of occlusion. During those two weeks while the patient has the temporary and that, that tooth with the temporary crown is going to super erupt and come into contact with that opposing tooth. And because that tooth has grown up to hit that other tooth, the crown that was made two, from the impression two weeks ago is going to be high and you have to grind on it to get it to fit. And now it's going to be ugly and possibly break sooner by the time you're grinding on it and you cement it into somebody's mouth. So m most dentists know that they have all, we've all experienced if you put a temporary crown in and let's say the patient goes away for six months because they don't have any money and they're embarrassed or if, if they forget they have a temporary or they're just traveling and it's not bothering them, they come back six months later. Most dentists know that the chance of that crown fitting is like slim and none after six months if you haven't seated it. Well, I'm here to tell dentists that the opposite is true as well. And so while I was at Glidewell, I started seating crowns three days after we prepped them. And you can only do this if you have a digital impression unit, because with a digital impression unit, you can prep a tooth, digitally scan it, and your laboratory technician can have that scan five minutes later. They don't have to do any stone work. There's no pouring up of stone and waiting for it to set and sawing out dies. They get it five minutes later. They can design the crown five minutes later and then mill it or press it after that. It can be ready that same day uh, or overnight if it's zirconian, so you can seat crowns on the third day. And I'm here to tell you, Kirk, it's a world of difference between seating crowns after two weeks, seating them in three days. In fact, you can't even find where that two weeks came from. It's mm -hmm. just like back in 1959 when the PFM was invented and most dentists started to use commercial dental laboratories, somebody came up with two weeks and everybody's like, yeah, that sounds good. And yes. it just became this adopted standard. There's no clinical research. There's no explanation in the literature anywhere about where this two weeks came from. And we just kind of all accepted it because that's what all labs did. But my life's mission is to stamp that out. That, that's got to go. That is leading to way too much, way too many adjustments, way too many crowns being ground on. And I'm here to change that by saying the closer to the prep date that you seed it, the less time you spent putting these crowns in. And that three day time is way better than the two week time. What's even better is same day, you know, but I, yeah. I understand if somebody's gonna get involved with chair side CAD camp, that's a financial commitment, that's a change to how you're doing things. And, you know, for a lot of dentists, they've tried that and they go, wow, this is fantastic. They no longer have a second appointment. The patient gets their crown the same day, it's great. But I understand there's a much bigger adjustment, but seating it after three days, instead of two weeks is a big deal. And, and a, crowns drop into place. They rarely need adjustment. If you follow Rella Christensen's um, disinfection and desensitization protocol at the when you put the temporary on with the two coats, the two one minute coats of glutaraldehyde and hema like Gluma. Um, if you do those two one minute coats, three days later, patient's tooth are still so desensitized you can take off the temporary clean it up without having to give them any local anesthesia and the crowns fit so much better than they do at two weeks but you got to get involved with digital technology right. so your laboratory can have that digital impression five minutes after you prep now even the labs aren't necessarily set up to do things at you know, get them back to you on the second day so you can seat it the third day. Uh, but they're never going to do it until we start asking for it as dentists. And I'm, I'm just telling the dentists who are watching this, it's going to make your life so much easier when you start putting crowns in after three days. The same way that six weeks and six months is worse than two weeks, I'm telling you, three days is way better 
than two weeks. And once you start doing that, you never want to go back. And it's the first you know, like dipping of your toe into digital technology and getting closer to doing it same day. So if there's not even a second appointment. You can do it all on that first appointment. But that three days will will change your Crown and Bridge life. Yeah. Now, if I'm sitting here watching this now, I totally agree with you because I've seen this firsthand so many times over and over and over again. But I'm going to go back to what you said. You know, you said 18 percent of what you saw was actually digital. What if I'm a young dentist? I'm going to play young dentist here, say, hey, look, Dr. Till, I totally understand. Like, it's something I so want to do, but I don't have any money. OK, or I don't I don't have the financial wherewithal to actually make that investment right now. You're really good at this, Mike. Take us through this. What are some quick and easy things I could do that will give me better results without spending a ton? Because that's really the underlying question here, because until I cross that bridge to be able to do the three days. Right. And um, I think one of the neat things that's available to um recent graduates is the ability to go out and work for somebody. I'll, I'll use Pacific Dental as an example, just because I know those guys really well. So that's a DSO out of Irvine, California. Their headquarters is just down the street from uh, Glidewell. I think they're up to 520 offices. Right. And they have a um, CEREC unit in every one of their offices. And so that that is a good way if you're just getting out of school and your school didn't give you a lot of access to digital technology. If you're not sure what you're going to do when you get out of school, that's a great place to go to be able to work on your speed a little bit, to be able to pursue, produce some dentistry and start to get out from underneath that $350,000 of debt that you had. And what a great way to experience that digital technology and see if it's for you or not before you actually invest in it yourself. So I think it's a really cool, cool opportunity for dentists to be able to do that. But yeah, if you're getting out and, and you're not doing that, I'm really convinced, Kirk, that that, that quality aesthetic restorations and, and crown and bridge are are simply a matter of dedicating yourself to that and deciding that you want to do that, which probably means slowing down ju just a little bit. Well, it means slowing down if you've been practicing for 20 years. If you just got out of school, you still need to speed up. But this is a perfect time to start learning these things. I'm so excited that two dental schools let me come in to their school and teach the students this reverse preparation technique. Because when you're a student, everything's hard. You're doing everything for the first time. And so learning two different ways to prep teeth is not a big deal. It's like a kid growing up in a bilingual household where they learn the word milk and leche. I mean, it's just another yeah. word. It's not, yeah. uh, it's, it's no more difficult when you're a kid. Those things only become difficult like piano lessons when you're an adult. When you're a kid, you're just a, like a sponge for this stuff. So if you're just getting out of school, you know, commit yourself to a depth cut based reduction system. And it does it doesn't have to be mine, but fine one. Um, there's just not a lot. I mean, there are some other people who talk about them, uh, a two, but it's it's worth doing these things the right way. Learn the amount of reduction. Be, start being good at the things that don't require talent. Yeah. All right. I mean, that's business. There's no excuse for not doing that. So know how much you have to reduce for an Emax crown, know how much for a, a lava crown, know how much for a solid zirconia crown and, and be good at the things that don't require talent. That's really what my prep technique ab is about is stamping the artistry out of prepping teeth. Yeah. It, I don't, I don't want to go to a healthcare professional where the quality of, of the care that I receive from them is contingent upon them being brilliant every day. Mm -hmm. Nobody can show up to work and be brilliant every day. You're going to go right. to work sometimes be tired, slightly hungover. You had a fight with your wife. I don't know, but you're not going to be performing at your best. Just like pilots, I'm sure, are not always having a great day. But between autopilot and the checklist, like yep. you said, way less than 1% of the planes are falling out of the sky. So we need enough safeguards in place so we can do that. The yeah. the two core the two chord impression technique, which is part of what you'll see on that reverse preparation video. Um, you know, taking the time to use two chords, especially in the anterior, there's nothing that'll give you the same kind of results as 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 being able to use those two chords to get lateral retraction of the gingival tissue away from the tooth. That's what technicians love. That if you want to make a dental technician fall in love with you whether they're cute or not. If you just want to be their favorite dentist and have them work the hardest and spend the most time on your crowns, give them a lot of lateral retraction of the tissue away from the, the prep margin. And the only ways to do that are with the two cord technique or with a diode laser. A diode laser will create instant horizontal retraction of the tissue by actually removing tissue. 
yeah. but that's going to cost you know a couple a couple thousand dollars. Um, and in the anterior, it's a little dicey removing that tissue around preps. I have no issue with it in the posterior. It works absolutely fine. Um, definitely make sure that you start doing Rella Christensen's desensitization and disinfection protocol, those two one-minute coats of the 5% glutaraldehyde, 35% HEMA before the temporary goes on. And then before the permanent crown goes on too, these layers of liquid are only eight microns thick, so it's not that big of a deal. Kirk, I don't think anything drives me more insane or I lose more stomach lining as a general dentist than post-operative sensitivity. It just sucks, especially when somebody came in and they weren't having sensitivity and then you say, oh, you need to have this done before it starts to hurt. And then you do it on them and now it's hurting as soon as it's done. and. Uh, they come in and they say, yeah, that, that crown's really sensitive. And you're like, when did it start to hurt? And they say, the second you put it on, you go, yes, no, no, I know. Have you been in any car accidents? And they're like, no. Oh, yeah. and, and you're like, well, you start asking questions. They're like, no, it started to hurt the second you put it on. You go, yes, I know yeah. it seems like that's a connection, but that really has nothing to do. They know that that's when it started to hurt. So anything we can do to reduce post-operative sensitivity, like using those two coats of, of the glutaraldehyde, like the Gluma or the Hema Seal inside or the G5 or any of these products go a long way towards doing that. Then if you're not going to do the three days and you're still going to do the two-week dentistry, you've got to kind of check up and you've got to lead by example with your assistant. So um, tomorrow at work or whenever, Wednesday, Thursday at work, just tell your assistant or who's ever making the temporaries, hey, you know what, before before these patients go today, can I, I just want to take a look at the temporary before they go. Yeah. And, um, and and just check it, you know, take a piece of like Acufilm, some kind of articulating media that's about 17 microns thick. And before the patient leaves, just have them, you know, bite down, check and see if you can see a centric stop. See if you can see a spot on the temporary where it's hitting the tooth across from it. If you do, then you're fine. That temporary is not going anywhere. And in two weeks, that crown will still drop into place. But if you check, you know, your assistant's four temporary crowns that day and none of them have an, a contact with the tooth across from it, this is why you're having to adjust too much on the seat appointment and just let her know, you know, once we have this temporary, if we're making it from like a double arch bite tray, um, don't polish the occlusal. You know, we've got to have a stop there or polish it very lightly. We still need to have a big blue dot. Well, the same size blue dot as we have on the adjacent unprepared teeth if we want to make sure this crown's going to fit. Because the scary part about it is when you start adjusting crowns, whether it's Emacs or a PFM crown, the more we grind on it, even when we polish the surface and make it smooth, when you start to look at SEMs of what's going on under the surface, there's this whole network of micro fractures that exist because you adjusted it. And over time, they connect and lead to failure of that crown. So our goal should be not to have to touch any crown at the seat appointment, not because we're lazy, but because we're doing the crown a disservice. And if our goal and the patient's goal is to make this good looking restoration let last for the next 10 or 15 years, the last thing we wanna do is take a dime into it and start adjusting it. It's just not gonna last as long. In fact, you can make almost you can make a decent argument for adjusting the natural tooth across from it. You know, it turns out God's teeth do much better um, with occlusal adjustments than, than the ones we make and then the ones that are lithium disilicate or glass or something like that. So make sure that who's ever making the temporaries in your office, whether it's you or the auxiliaries, is leaving that nice centric stop there so that you're going to have very few, hopefully less than 10% adjustments uh, on that on that second appointment. And if you're doing those two coats of the desensitizer, like Rella says, before the temp goes on and then before the permanent crowns on, goes on, you should have crowns that you rarely have to touch and aren't having any post-operative sensitivity. And that's pretty much all you can ask for as a dentist is patients who say yes to treatment and then you have crowns that drop into place without any post-operative sensitivity. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things, I took a bunch of notes here as you were talking too, because I found this to be absolutely true. And I, I'm so glad you said it. A lot of times this stuff can be fixed if you just slow down a little bit. A lot of these younger dentists, they're just trying to go too fast. You see diagnosis is way too low to practice just because they're not slowing down having these conversations, how they do the dentistry. And I've heard so many great clinicians say this. You know what? Most every dentist could do really great dentistry if they just 
slow down. But there is yeah. so much of a hurry to get onto the next thing, to not do it right, to not have the processes set up. So um, it's kind, it's it flies in the face of conventional wisdom because you think you can do more by going a little bit faster, but you can actually go a whole lot farther and a whole lot better if you just slow down just a little bit. A, a good example of that is the uh, the technicians at Glidewell, who um, they're paid a like a minimum base pay, mm -hmm. but most of the pay for a technician at Glidewell and a lot of other labs, um, you get paid by how many crowns you do. So it's kind of like Dennis. You know, if a lab technician makes ten crowns in a day. Or if they make 20 crowns in a day, they'll make essentially twice as much as if they did 10 crowns in a day, which is the same for a dentist. But also, much like a dentist, if a laboratory tech has to redo a crown, they, they don't get paid for redoing that crown, just like we don't as a dentist. So if we go too fast and we put two crowns on somebody and three months later, there's an open contact or open margins and it's sensitive – if we have to take off those two crowns and replace those, we lost all the profit from that case and another one or two is we're having to redo this for free Thursday from 10 to 11. So you can just kiss away the $350, $350 in fixed overhead. You're losing $1,200 an hour in like lost opportunity costs by not being able to do real dentistry then. And you might say, well, it was just Thursday from 10 to 11, but that hour is gone and it's never coming back. And as a dentist, the only way we ever – really produce income is sitting chair side and those hours are are kind of precious for us so as a laboratory technician or a dentist you want to go as fast as you can you want to be as efficient as you can to do the job right because if you have to redo it you're not getting paid for that and it and it's just not worth it when you look at how much it truly costs you to have to redo something like that so we're trying to balance efficiency um and doing it right. There was a guy the other day at the uh, NFL Combine on Friday who ran a 4.22. Saw that. Uh, and just blasted through the old record from like two, Chris Johnson's record from like 2008. Um, but somebody else could have been running a four flat and then you trip and fall 20 mm -hmm. yards into it. And it's it's all for naught. So you can't go so fast you lose your balance. And the same is true here. And when dentists start measuring their remakes, as we said in the beginning of the conversation, if you see you have 32% remakes, you absolutely need to slow down because you're going to be happier and you're going to make more money, even if you do less crown and bridge, but it's at a 6% remake rate instead of a 32% remake rate. Yeah, that's awesome. We always say what gets measured gets improved, but what gets measured and reported on gets exponentially improved. Because if you're watching this on a chart, like you guys did, you could actually pull that up and see the remake rates go down. It's amazing how much more effective, happier. You know, I look at a lot of times we're not necessarily looking at the dental aesthetic or um, functional results in a lot of cases, but we're looking at the remake rates in a lot of great restorative practice. That remake rate goes up a little bit. Everything goes wrong. Your lab costs are now higher in a lot of cases. I mean, that time element is huge. Um, and then you also have the little vein right here coming yeah. way out. So right. you can measure that in financial, but man, that's when that vein comes way out and you can see the exponential impact on its stress on the dentist. And the patient's not real happy either, by the way, they've got to take yeah. another half day off work to come back and, and get this done again. And, and it's just not, it's not worth go, going that fast to, to have to redo it. It's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So what else? Do you have any other quick, like I love the low hanging fruit or the, you know, easy things people could do without spending a ton of money, to get better results. You know, you get to see a lot of this. So what, what else would you tell a young dentist who's looking for better results, but not a huge budget? Um, I just think, you know, if you watch that, that reverse preparation video, there's one, there's one burr on there that I'll give a shout out to. We're not going to list all the burrs, but it's an 801 O two one eight oh one being the shape, which is a round ball, okay, and o o two one being the diameter, so it's two point one uh, millimeters wide. It comes in other smaller um, shapes a, as well. I got the idea. That's what I used. I prep. A, I use the um, round burr to prep the gingival margin, and I do it very early in the technique. And this was an idea that I got from an old nineteen forties prosthodontic textbook that I bought on eBay. I like to go on eBay and buy like old uh, dental stuff. And I was looking through it and I was like, wow, I should try this one day. And um, I remember ordering this burr and just trying it. And I, I looked down when I was done prepping it in the mirror at this prep. And I, I couldn't believe what I saw. I, mm -hmm. it, was, it was the best margin I had prepped in, the, in 17 years of my career. And it was also the easiest one. Wow. And I, I was all, I can't believe this. 
And I, I looked at my assistant, I said, take a look at that prep. And she looked at it, and she looked at it too in her mirror and said, wow. I said, I know, I, I can't believe I did that. She's like, I can't believe you did it either. I was like, you don't get to say that. Only I get to say yeah. that. And I was like, I didn't pass out in the middle and, and Gordon came in and finished it, right? She goes, no, no, you actually did that with the whole thing, you know, yourself yeah. with your left hand. I, I mean, it was, I'm left-handed by the way. And um, it, it, I just, I'll never forget looking down that first time and and seeing that. And it was, a, and I was just amazed. So that burr, that 801 diamond burr, um, using it, as you'll see in the video for doing the gingival margin, ju just try that because the way we were taught to prep gingival margins in dental school is about the most difficult way that you can. They, they, they're they teaching a technique that works fine for the top 10% of students, but you can teach them anything. They're so artistic, they'll make, that you could tape the hand piece to their foot and they would right. make it work. I'm talking about a prep technique for the other 90% of us. You know, the ones who weren't born with this incredible set of hands that would allow us to sculpt things out of stone or sculpt preps out of teeth without any help. The, the other 90% of us who could use a technique that makes it a little easier, easier for us. The other thing I can say, uh, kind of low hanging fruit, the single biggest thing we did at Glidewell to reduce the remake rates of dentists. We had spent years and years preaching better preps, better impressions, but it was when we introduced solid zirconia in 2009 that we started to see dentists improve their remake rate by 30%. It, it wow. was shocking. It was shocking. And it was from, because of the fact that solid zirconia is one of these rare materials in dentistry that allows dentists to get better results without their preps and impressions having to get any better. Well, specifically kind of their preps getting any better. And so one of the big problems we see when dentists prep for Emacs crowns, for example, very, very popular crown material, is that it needs a deep chamfer all the way around um, the prep margin of the tooth. And constantly you'll see that dentists will give you a great margin, but it turns to a little feather edge margin on the distal lingual. And even though it's just that one spot, now all of a sudden you can't make an Emacs crown there. Or if you do, there's a pretty good chance that it'll break there. And, and so for dentists who had lots of remakes or they had problems with PFMs breaking in that same place, when we introduced solid zirconia and they switched over to it, that, that material, solid zirconia, makes up for a ton of errors on, on the dentist part without penalizing them for it. So a high strength, um, all ceramic material like solid zirconia can go a long way. Anytime you have a prep where you're not quite sure if you reduced enough here or there, solid zirconia is a great way to, to utilize the, the benefits of a material that will almost work with the shittiest of preps. I mean, that's really the nice thing about it is that it will almost find a way to work with almost any prep, regardless of how wonky or bad it might be. Not necessarily even because of the dentist. It may be a super uncooperative patient who made it really hard to prep on them. Uh, but solid zirconia, Gordon once pulled me to the side and said, uh, solid zirconia saved dentistry. And I was like, yeah, that's a little strong. Mm -hmm. uh, but 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 it's close in a way because it, it really it really does help. So anytime you've got any questions about whether or not the prep's adequate or not, solid zirconia go goes a long way towards making sure that uh, it doesn't matter because it'll work with almost anything. Yeah. On the topic of saving dentistry, you know, this is, um, dude, you're so brilliant. This is amazing. Uh, and I want to do a bunch more on these because I have a ton more topics I want to cover with you. But I, we, we have a lot of young dentists watching these, you know, all over the country. And you and I were talking about this before we get started. I don't subscribe to the whole fear thing. I know you don't too. What would you say, you know, you've now had quite a bit of time to see dentistry, how great the profession is. What would you say to young dentists coming out like absolute advice what you've learned and just if you were to, if you were to give them something in this what would you say well again i think it's uh i when i came out of school um there was like uh well there's two options you know it was like buy buy a practice or you know or start a practice kind of thing i mean even associateships were difficult to find back then because there was a lot of uh you know solo practitioners that was kind of the dream back in in my day that's why we went to um to dental school i'm amazed to see dentists who graduate and go into something like pacific and get on an ownership track with pacific dental and i'll see doctors you know seven or eight years out of school who now own two or three practices you know because of that what that corporate structure offers them i think it's a great time to be able to graduate and be able to go out and kind of find yourself working at a place like pacific to see what it is 
um, that that you really that you really like. Um, and I think it's a great idea because the dentists who are graduating today, when you talk to them about uh, how many procedures they did in school, I felt like we were woefully undertrained when I graduated in 1988 because we graduated having done 25 crowns. And I routinely talk to graduates today when I say, how many crowns did you do to graduate? And they'll say six, you know, eight and numbers like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, that yeah. barely, that barely makes you kind of a safe uh, a beginner. And, and so it's really great to be able to go to a place like that. And they're so desperate, you know, they're all hiring. I don't, there was an ad in the California Dental Association yeah. Journal um, last month where uh, Heartland was paying $30,000 signing bonuses out of dental school. I'm like, oh, this is great. They're like free agent athletes. Yeah. Um, but all the DSOs will tell you that the only thing limiting their growth is like uh, warm bodies, you know, is having being able to hire enough dentists. And Kirk, you might be surprised that Pacific was telling me that they struggle to find dentists coming out of school. All they want them to do in a day is is um, uh, diagnose, you know, treatment plan, a crown and a half worth of production a day, or get case acceptance for a crown and a half in terms of dollars production a day, and then physically produce a crown and a half worth of production a day. And they have a hard time finding those. It's like, you know, 30 to 40% of the dentists they hire can diagnose and get case acceptance for a crown and a half and then physically treat a crown and a half per day, which isn't a ton, you know, once you've been in practice um, for a while. So I think it's a great way to go out and and find and experiment with techniques, you know, get a right. chance to see different endo techniques, see some digital dentistry, try some new prep techniques, take whatever courses they have to offer in addition to what what you're doing. And I, I just met somebody, she's been out of school now for 10 years, but she worked, uh, she's in the Pacific Northwest and she worked for Gentle Dental, a, a DSO up there for two years and uh, did that same kind of thing, kind of found where she was and then started a practice from scratch with some crazy 10 year goals. She actually showed her numbers, what she, her and her accountant hoped that she would do um, in production and collections the first 10 years. And she did like within 95% of these crazy numbers, but you can tell she's like a, she's like a pit bull that's on a piece of rawhide. You know, she's yeah. just very, very uh, focused on it. She's, she's very determined. And um, yeah, you, you kind of have to be. And so the old thing that you used to hear from Dennis was, oh, I went to dental school because I didn't want to go into sales. I didn't want to sell insurance. But as it turns out, we're all in sales, whether it's trying to get oh, somebody to marry you or go on a date with you or <laughs> say yes to a crown or some veneers. It's just, it, it's kind of all sales. It, it, and if you want to put it another way, it's all influence. I mean, I see yeah. it with, with, with your children, with your neighbors, with your employer, with whoever. It's just all, it's all influence. And, and, it, it and, and so, and just become kind of a, a, a student of, of that, of self improvement of looking uh, of Toastmasters of, you know, the yeah. National Speakers Association of whatever it might be. It all comes down to interpersonal relationships. Some of the highest producing dentists I know are dentists I would never go to for a crown because I've seen their, I've seen their <laughs> prep and impressions. It's got nothing to do with quality. That's yeah. not, no, it's, and my point being, because I'm right. all about trying to get better quality, but my point is, when it comes to that kind of stuff, the financial stuff, it's it's all to do with the interpersonal stuff and your ability to bond with somebody quickly. Yeah. And, you, and if you can do it on an airplane sitting next to somebody or if you can do it in line at Home Depot, you know, that it, it, it's something worth developing because it's that kind of instant rapport. If you can if you can create that inside the dental office, the first or second time you meet somebody and you tell them we should do these four crowns. Yeah. They will do it, but it's all based on that. It's not based on you're not a lawyer giving yep. a closing argument to the uh, jury about why these four crowns should be done. It's just all about this kind of interpersonal um, connection and and influence. And it's not it's not manipulation. I'm trying to be I'm trying to influence Dennis today on this podcast. Yeah, to get to get better results. I don't really necessarily get anything out of it besides selfishly feeling good that maybe in some tiny way one dentist heard it and improved their preps and impressions, but I have a passion and a need to kind of share that. And it was the same way with, yeah. with patients. I tried to make every patient laugh four or five times while they were in the chair for each appointment because I wanted them to leave in a better mood than when they got there. And I think that's important too. If they, if they can come in and we can shove a needle into their face 
and drill on them and and they leave in this as as good of a mood or maybe slightly better because we've had some fun or you know whatever with them um that's gonna go a long way i just met a dentist the other day who sings to his patients does he really he sings to them and i was like what like what do you sing <laughs> it said opera come um, on I, having dinner with he and his wife i go opera i go that's amazing i had no idea he was such a good singer she goes oh he's awful oh really I said really he goes yeah i'm pretty bad he said but i started taking lessons seven years ago mm-hmm. and so we start doing it because when we you know if you're taking a polyvinyl impression it's in the patient's mouth for four minutes and that's when he just kind of starts singing because he enjoys singing and now he kind of has this reputation and and patients like hearing it from other rooms and they ask are you gonna you know, are you gonna sing something today and it's just it's just a way to connect with patients who are nervous anyway because they're there. But I think most dentists wouldn't do something like that because they say, oh, it, I don't look professional then. It's like if they didn't think you were professional, they wouldn't come in. Yeah. You know, cr- create a connection with them. It's the same thing we try to do as speakers, right, Kirk? Yep. We're trying to connect with the audience by showing them a side of ourselves they don't usually see. And it's the same with your patients. So everything you learn in a speaking class is the same thing you need to be successful in dentistry. I mean, as much as I'm talking crown margins, it, success in that sense does not come down to crown margins, but yes, you can have it both and you should strive for both. Um, but just, just becoming a better speaker and more personable, just fake it. If it's not real, just fake it. I mean, it's yeah. really tight. Do it well. People, people, <laughs> can't tell, but the, yeah. I, I think that it comes down to it and you best learn how to do that early on because if you're not fun to be around and people don't enjoy uh, your, your company. There's too many choices and too many, you know, dentists making the experience really nice right now. And it's it's going to be a long career. Yeah, it's a huge opportunity. I've, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. I've always thought that your ability to communicate, how far you go in communication and trust will determine how successful you become as a dentist. And you can have both. You can But, the, you know, the common joke here is that some kids in dental school that partied all the time and had lots of friends and the kid that worked really hard struggled and there is some truth to that but the the the, the key piece is that don't stay there you know once you get out you got to you got to start developing these things and the other thing you know I just piggyback on some of those things. Finding a job sometimes fresh out of dental school is a good thing because you don't really know yourself. At 24 I was a moron, okay? So I didn't know anything because you got it all figured out when you're 24. By the time you're 30, you're like, wow, I've, there's a lot I don't know yet. And, but you're becoming a little bit more self-aware about what you don't want. And now you can maybe buy a practice or build a practice and start to hit the ground running. And it's just key. Now, one other thing I just want to think of the last we were trying to recount the last time you and I saw each other and we saw each other at, at Hinman and you came up to me and you said, hey, I, I just want to tell you there's no room for two bald, funny guys here. And I I absolutely, I told you right away, like, you're the bald, funny guy. I'm just a wannabe. But I did hear this rumor, and I got to ask you, because I, and you know, you know I love you. Did you have a hair piece at one time? Like, you yeah. you actually, you did? Yeah. You're a good looking fella. You don't need one. But um, you- Yeah, I, well, I, I never thought I needed one. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it, the, the, I don't know if we have time for this story, but this, <laughs> it, this was the story I told it at Sarek 27 and a half before okay. Steve Martin and Martin Short. Um, I, I never told this story before on stage, uh, but I decided this would be a good way to connect with the audience by, um, embar- by, you know, just telling something that was kind of embarrassing. So, you know, kind of my biggest secret. Yeah. That was kind of the theme was like uh, my di- my dirty little secrets. Mm-hmm. And I, I told a couple secrets that day. And and one of them was uh, about this this hair piece that I used to wear because um, I, I came home. I came home one day from the office and um, there was a brochure uh, sitting on the kitchen counter from a local plastic surgeon who did hair restoration. Okay. And there was a I was like, what is that? And there, I noticed there was a post-it note on it from my ex-wife, who was my right. wife at the time. Right. But it said, uh, Michael, you know, I made you an appointment <laughs> for a consultation, you know, love Jody. And we had never talked about this before. We and all, all of a sudden I just come home to find she made an appointment for me <laughs> at a hair restoration specialist. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then to write this on a note and sign it with love, I'm like, love, is this love, you know, it's telling somebody to, and it would have been like, if I had left a brochure out for her for like a breast enhancement, plastic <laughs> surgeon, 
saying, honey, I love you as a B cup, but I'd be much, I'd be a lot happier if you were a small C, uh, a large C or a small D. Uh, love, Michael. And it was this weird passive aggressive move that really got me into my head. And we, we had no communication skills. So the short story is that um, I saw a patient at the office whose hair I was admiring because I started to get hair envy with all the patients. And I had my loops on and this one guy's hair was so beautiful. Uh-huh. And I was like, dude, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I'm in love with your hair. <laughs> and uh, he started, it was during an injection and he started laughing. And uh, I said, sorry, I, I wasn't hitting on you. And he goes, no, 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 I'm just laughing because this isn't my hair. This is a hair piece. And I was like, oh my God, I'm looking at it with my loops and I can't tell. Mm-hmm. So to me, this was an easy way to not, you know, do the Barbie rows of hair, you know, surgery, like hair restoration surgery used to be 20 years ago. Yeah. And so I got this hair piece ostensibly to, to make my ex-wife happy. And it just kind of became the bane of my existence. And so after the divorce, um, the story that I tell on stage is kind of all that lead up. And then about the moment where the girl who I start dating, who I've still been dating for the last uh, 11, 11 years. Um, it's about me kind of coming clean to her about it. Like she didn't know, like people didn't know, like I was fooling people that much. But it's about the moment when I pulled it off in front of her for the first time and, and what happened then. So it's a it is a, it's a special story to me. It needs a large audience. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it doesn't, it's just not fun to tell it in front of 35 people in Newark, New Jersey. But when you yeah. get thousands of people and there's a lot of women in the crowd it's uh, it's a story i love to tell and i haven't told it for uh many years maybe i'll do it again this year at ds world but um and i do show pictures of myself with the hair piece on and very like 1.0 2.0 and 3.0 like uh it's way too dark and way too long in the beginning yeah. and you start to learn hey lay off a bit dude <laughs> you know, maybe put a little gray in there maybe thin it out in some areas and uh it, it was the greatest day of my life when i took that off and I remember being so nervous. Um, I took it off on a Friday and shaved uh, my head for the first time. And I remember going into work, driving into work to Glidewell on Monday, just wanting to steer that car into a telephone pole. Oh just want to kill myself because <laughs> when I left Friday, I had a full head of hair. And now I was coming back with my head shaved. And I was like, oh, oh God, no. I just don't want to answer all these questions about where did your – hair go but fortunately the people who care about you and love you ask very few questions and i explained it quickly and it kind of went away but it's been a great lesson for me in terms of being authentic and and being true to myself um and uh so yeah so when i when i told that lecture i had that i had it in my pocket and i took it out and slapped it and slapped it on my head so yeah you know it's funny i've heard that story from other people i probably heard that from five or six people and they all say the same thing. You've got to be there. Like I almost fell out of my chair when he was telling that story. And I'm like, he had like, everybody loves you. You know what I mean? It's true. You know, once you're authentic, everybody just loves you. So I'll send you the video of that story. They, uh, I have video of me telling that at, at, at that meeting. So I'll, I'll send it to you in case. You well, we'll see. post it on here. I'm going to post it on here. If you would send it to me, also send me the link to the burr and the reverse prep. We'll, we'll put all those in there, make it easy for people to find. And I think we even have a photo. Um, I, ben, I don't know if you have that, but throw that up there. That would be awesome. I think Josh sent us a photo of you and Howard like years ago, and it is absolutely awesome. So I love it, man. It's, it's so good to tell you. I I started losing my hair at 14 and I was doing the comb over thing and then I put hairspray in it and then I'd walk and it would flip <laughs> up like this. And my mom was like, okay, we just got to do something. So I went on the defensive a long time ago, but uh, good dude, for you. You're, you're amazing, buddy. I really, really appreciate this. And uh, like I said, I just appreciate what you do. You're a genius out there. If you haven't seen this guy speak, you got to go see it. Tell us a little bit about the next, the big extravaganza. When, uh, what are the dates? Where's it at? Like you're it's already in, planning it. You got it oh all. Yeah. yeah, we're we're well into planning it. And as it turns out, there is a lot of um a lot of negotiating back and forth when you're dealing with um dealing with celebrities. So like at, at last year's meeting, um we had uh like I said, Richard Sir Richard Branson, Jerry Seinfeld and the band One Republic was there. The year before that we had Tony Robbins and Train and Emmett Smith, the running back from the Dallas Cowboys. And this year um, it's it, at the Venetian September 14th to the 16th of this year. We expect there to be 8,000 attendees. So this will be our wow. biggest meeting ever. And, uh, boy, I wish I could tell you who were very close to signing for the band and the celebrity, but, uh, celebrities pretty squarely in the A list. 
of uh, of movie stars, and I can't, I can't. If it goes through, I can't wait to be able to sit on stage and interview them for uh, an hour. And uh, very cool band as well. I wish I wish I could tell you more, but we call it the ultimate dental meeting, and we've called it that since we merged with Dentsply because it used to just be a meeting, and it's called Dentsply Serona World now. We've changed the name tw- twice recently, but it's staying Dentsply Serona World or DS World for short. And and now that we've got. Um, all the different divisions of dense ply. It used to just be a meeting that was all about Serec and cone beam, but now it's, you know, endo, ortho, implants, preventive, perio, it's, it's everything. So it's like a, it's like a version of your state meeting, you know, mm-hmm. compressed down into two and a half days with uh, a million and a half dollars spent on the, the entertainment uh, wow. as well. And so it's different. And so the, whatever band we have, it's essentially a personal concert for the people who are there. So if you get there early, you'll be leaning up against the stage, you know, watching the band and you just don't get the opportunity to do that um, very often. So that's uh, DS world at the Venetian September 14th uh, to the 16th. Love to see everybody there. I'll give you those video links. Um, you can get in contact with me through uh, drdatola.com is um, the website or email me at Densply uh, Serona. But um, otherwise, Kirk, I've had the chance to see you speak before and you have you have it. You have the ability to connect um, with an audience uh, like only a few people, you know, kind of do in, in dentistry. And uh, I've been very impressed and I wouldn't have made that comment to you. I mean, I was tongue in cheek about we can only have one bald uh, funny guy, but we spoke together for Gordon uh, yeah. at, his, at his LDS meeting in Provo. And uh, I had heard about you, but I don't think I'd seen you, at least not seen you speak um, your your full program until then. And uh, it was inspirational. It was great. Um, you obviously have uh, a gift for connecting like that. You would have made a great dentist. You would have a $2 million practice uh, just because of your personality. And I mean, a lot of times that's that's what it comes down to is a willingness to Connect with people. Even if you can do it, it's easy right. to be lazy and not want to do it. It's easy to get on the plane and put the headphones on, but you can't do that in your dental practice. Or you can't metaphorically put them on and just kind of just not want to engage with people and ask them about their weekend and ask them about their kids and all the dumb stuff that you wouldn't think has anything to do with being successful, but has an awful lot with being successful. Amen, brother. And you have done that so well. So thank Thank you you very much. I really appreciate you. And then, like I said, if you have comments as you're watching this today or even watching the replay a little bit later, add the feed to the right and I'll see if I can't get the master himself to answer that. I'm sure you're going to get a ton of questions on some of the stuff that you shared today. These were awesome, awesome little snippets of great help. So thank you, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Kirk. See you soon. All right, guys, until next time, we'll see you on the Best Practices Show. Have a great day. Peace out.